Well, Judge Murphy, thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, uh, if anybody is in trouble and needs a solicitor, though, don't come to me. You'll get very bad value for money, I, I promise. Um, but I, 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 let me just say before another word what an honour it is to share the platform with Judge Murphy. Um, I don't know if any of us have had the chance to say to her in person uh, what, what, what she's done for us. Uh, in her reports, and I can't even begin to imagine how painful and difficult it was to go through all of that material and then to draw those tough conclusions for our society. So, if you don't mind, which I just like to quick call you. Thank you. Well, uh, let me also bring you greetings from Belfast, where I live these days. Um, I don't know if you've ever done that journey by train, but it feels like you're, you're crossing all of Russia. It takes so long. But uh, it was very interesting to, um, to traverse Ireland today and report to you that the weather is more or less the same everywhere today. Um, uh, also, um, by way of my rambling uh, beginning this evening, uh, I'd like to just acknowledge or comment on an extraordinary experience I had for the last few days, which is that I um, attended a conference in Dublin organised under the Irish chairmanship of the OSCE on internet freedom. Uh, I don't know, maybe you've seen the reports of this. It got reasonable coverage, uh, slightly outshone by Aung San Suu Kyi, but uh, when, once the papers had done with her, there was a bit of space left for this conference, and uh, it was an absolutely extraordinary event. It was uh, one of the most interesting I've ever attended, and certainly one of the most uh, unusually organised. Um, but the reason I'm mentioning it to you this evening is because I was struck by the extent to which the debate over two days on the topic of internet freedom was constructed entirely around notions of freedom of expression. Freedom of expression was the, was the, um, was the engine uh, uh, by which everything occurred over the two days, the context, the prism uh, through which everything had to be seen. Uh, the prism in terms of defining what is a legitimate space uh, for the internet, what are the, how wide are the parameters uh, for internet freedom. Uh, secondly, freedom of expression was used as a reference point to map out the limits uh, to a legitimate space for operation of the internet. And thirdly, uh, just about all of the great challenges and risks and dangers that are posed in the context of discussion of uh, the internet uh, also seem to be ref made sense of uh, and given reference in terms of protecting, promoting, preserving freedom of expression. Um, just to illustrate uh, those rather vague statements to you, uh, firstly, in terms of the space for internet operation, uh, the point was made by speaker after speaker, be they, be, be they from Google or be they from companies I've never heard of or be they from academics or whoever else, um, but they all reiterated that the internet as a vehicle for freedom of expression is, is a conveyor of many other rights. In other words, that unless we have a strong, largely unfettered freedom of expression, then we don't just l lose the right to express ourselves and to listen to the views of others, but we lose the capacity to deliver on almost any other category of human right you think of. In other words, that freedom of expression is, and the term was used once or twice in the last few days, it's a meta-right. It's a right in and of itself, but it also is a crucial vehicle for the enjoyment of any number of other civil rights, political rights, even economics and social rights, and indeed cultural rights as well. Um, that's quite easy to grasp when it comes to uh, a range of civil rights, freedom of association, freedom of assembly. They look pretty meaningless without expression. Freedom of religion, the same thing. It uh, becomes less obvious, I suppose, when we talk about socio-economic rights, the right to health care, the right to shelter. Uh, you might ask, what's expression got to do with that? But as I was reminded over the last few days, you don't take shelter and health care and things of this nature seriously from a rights point of view unless you involve the rights holder in the decision-making process about how they receive their health care, how they enjoy their right to shelter. And so therefore, you can't have these rights either unless you have freedom of expression. And so um, a, 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 the mapping out of the space, as I said, in that conference, very much rooted in these profound understandings of freedom of expression as somehow of some primordial significance. 
Turning then to the threats and the challenges uh, that are confronted in managing uh, the debate around the internet, it was interesting that the issues that were thrown up in the conference were exactly the same issues that would come up if we removed the internet from the discussion and just talked about what are the risks to freedom of expression today. I, I, I've spoken about our work on this in the UN Human Rights Committee in a few other places in the last few months. And in those places, I've given a standard list of the risks and the threats. And lo and behold, it's exactly the same list that was come up with by all of the participants in Dublin over the last couple of days. So they spoke, for example, about the way in which um, politics can raise issues and problems for expression, protecting uh, the good name of politicians, even lying and corrupt politicians who don't want the true stories about their past or their present uh, to come out into the open around election time. Uh, problems around protecting religious space. I'll come back to that in a few moments. Um, of when is it or is it not appropriate to restrict speech uh, in the interest of protecting the right to religion? This has, of course, all got to do with issues of blasphemy laws. Uh, tremendous debates over the protection of reputation. Um, uh, what is reputation? Uh, what, are, what are the legitimate restrictions around protection of, rem of reputation in the interests of free speech? Uh, all of the drama over the clash of speech and national security, uh, a, a dimension uh, of the dilemma which has become so much more obvious since 9-11. Uh, and so on it goes. Uh, uh, there isn't time or it doesn't make sense to list every one of these categories today. But thirdly, and as by pretty much my last word on the Dublin conference, it turned from a discussion of the risks and the threats to a free space for expression and a thriving internet uh, to a reflection on when is it necessary and legitimate to limit uh, expression, be it on the internet or otherwise. In other words, a general recognition that absolute free speech is not a social good and that some boxing of the space is needed. Now, we don't have time to go into it today and it isn't really the topic I'm supposed to speak about, which I haven't even arrived at yet, uh, but the um, uh, it was interesting at this conference, uh, the, it was my first time encountering in the flesh a, a new view emerging out of Silicon Valley uh, to the effect that the internet is so different, thank you very much, that such outdated notions as human rights and the protection of the rights of others and thereby limits on, on internet space uh, uh, could never be legitimate, uh, that somehow we need new rules, which by the way they would say are no rules for this brave new world of the internet. And so for instance for them, privacy is a passé concept, uh, as is everything else uh, that would impose legitimate restrictions. But in any case, that's still, thank goodness, a minority view. And so we found ourselves discussing what are the limits, if limits there must be, given the capacity of states and others to run a coach and forward through any right, uh, once you start to speak about the limits on that right. And so, why did I talk about the last two days? Well, partly because I wanted to share with you something that was really very interesting, um, but much more importantly, because the two days in Dublin brought home a reiterated, a reaffirmed for myself and for the other participants, the extent to which that when we speak of freedom of expression, we're talking about a right of the most primordial and fundamental significance for the entire human rights construct, which is challenged by a wide range of very disturbing threats, contemporary threats across the world, across all manner of form and across all the various media, uh, and which nevertheless cannot distract us from a recognition that notwithstanding the risks involved, we do have to identify some restraints around this right. In other words, the OSCE con conference uh, opened up uh, and demonstrated the maelstrom of challenges and difficulties around mapping the space for that most fundamental of human rights, uh, freedom of expression. And it's that maelstrom, it's that context, it's that sense of deep significance uh, that informed the UN Human Rights Committee uh, just over two years ago when it decided that it was high time uh, to do a new legal analysis of freedom of expression, of Article 19 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights to give fresh new global guidance and how this right is to be promoted, protected uh, and how, what are the limits uh, on the power of the state to restrict it.
Um, but before saying anything about our work on the General Comment, uh, which is mentioned in the title there, General Comment 34, just a quick bit of background uh, uh, about the protection of freedom of expression in the relevant treaty, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. As many of you will know, it's to be found in Article 19 of the Covenant, which by a happy, not so accident, it was deliberate, but it's a happy, happy chance nevertheless, uh, that it, 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 it is, the right is found in Article 19 of the Covenant, and of course also in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And uh, it's because of this coincidence of the, the, the use of the the Article 19 in the two great instruments of the UN on civil rights that uh, the wonderful organization Article 19 was established by Kevin Boyle. It's from that that the name of that fantastic NGO derives. But as I say, freedom of expression is to be found in Article 19 which sets up a pretty sturdy protection of the space for expression. It's a, it's a wider remit than you'll find in the European Convention on Human Rights. The, 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 the freedom, the right itself is stated more starkly, more simply, with fewer exceptions, with a more limited space for the state to restrict than you'll find in, not only in the European uh, language, but also in the language of the other regional treaties. Um, you'll also find uh, freedom of expression protected elsewhere in the Covenant around aspects of, for example, the right to a fair trial, freedom of religion and belief, uh, and a number of other articles. And so when we talk about freedom of expression in the UN guarantees, uh, it's not just a bare single article, but it's a, it's a range of other references, all of which bolster it and support it. Um, I should say by way of completeness, of course, as well, that uh, there are other articles that restrain expression, uh, and the most famous of those is the article which imposes a requirement on states to prohibit certain forms of extreme hate speech. Uh, that's found in Article 20 of the Covenant. How has Article 19 and the freedom of expression fared since it was first negotiated uh, and adopted in the Covenant back in 1966? It's fared pretty well. Uh, I'm sorry, I should say, when I say fared, how has it fared in the hands of the oversight body for the Covenant, uh, the Human Rights Committee, the body on which I serve, the, which has a monitoring responsibility for the 167 states that are parties to the treaty across the world? And I'd argue that in those years, since the committee started its work, it's been a pretty sturdy defender of freedom of expression. You don't find too much jurisprudence that backtracks from the right, that, um, that, that diminishes it through, um, uh, through unfortunate interpretation. Um, on the contrary, you find a, a, a clear theme running through all the case law, uh, right back since the beginning, uh, of a recognition that the right is the norm and the restriction is the exception. And, and a, a, a conscious awareness all through practice that that balance must never be lost in the way in which uh, the um, article is interpreted. And that's, a, as I say, a, a global sense of the legacy of the almost 40 years of application. But of course, uh, over those 40 years, nevertheless, many questions have arisen uh, which, 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 which are worrying. Uh, due either to the committee not having had a chance to engage on a, on a particular topic or, have, or, or perhaps having come, come up with um, an odd or an in, sometimes inexplicable, uh, sometimes hard to fathom interpretation in a given context. Um, these have left us with such questions as how wide is expression? Uh, are there forms of the transmission of an idea that are not expression? Uh, there, there was a, a very interesting case going back a while uh, with regard to graffiti on road signs in, in um, Brittany. And uh, way back then, as an old case, the committee decided that graffiti, political graffiti on a, a road sign in Brittany uh, was not expression. Now, if you come from the west of Ireland, where you, sp you, you, gr you grow up uh, with the gr graffiti all over the road signs, turning them from Berla into Gaelga, you recognise that this is indeed a very, <laughs> you may like it or not like it, that doesn't matter, but this is expression. But nevertheless, there was some ambiguity in the um, practice. Um, another, um, uh, another very important and more contemporary question mark that had arisen had to do with the application of Article 19 and all of the classic practice and jurisprudence with regard to the internet. Now, have no fear, I'm not going to talk about Dublin anymore, um, but, but this, this, this 
it, 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 had, it took time for the issue to emerge that, hey, does this stuff apply? Uh, is the digital world such a brave, new and utterly different world that new standards are required, that the old protections are no longer valid or legitimate, or indeed, as, as I said, re reflecting some views, not all, but some views from Silicon Valley, uh, has human rights anything to do with this space at all? And so there was a need to clarify that. Uh, still another of the open questions had to do with freedom of information. To what extent uh, did or does Article 19 and freedom of expression embrace uh, any aspects of a right of freedom of access to information? Uh, this had um, become a more pressing question in very recent past where the committee uh, had taken some hesitant, tentative steps into this area in some decisions, but where, to be honest, its findings left as many questions as answers. Uh, those three points have to do with the breadth of expression uh, and some of the issues surrounding that. Uh, there were no less questions around the extent to which a state can restrict expression. And again, just to give you a few examples there. Um, under the Covenant, Article 19, Paragraph 3, restriction of expression has to be done uh, through the vehicle of law. It can't be through administrative whimsy. But what is law? for purposes uh, of the requirements of Article 19. Um, at what remove from a statutory framework does the action remain law? If a Garda superintendent uh, uh, makes a request that some material be removed from a website or some information being disclosed regarding uh, internet addresses, let's say, or email contents, um, and, and that's on the basis of some remote statutory framework five layers of decision-making away, does that constitute law? Or is something uh, 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 different required, including, for example, or perhaps judicial review of every single request? Um, another um, uh, a question that had become increasingly difficult to engage with in any clear fashion was how the principle of, of proportionality applies with regard to the efforts of states to restrict freedom of expression. Um, the, um, the, the, how the inherent test that the action of the state must be proportionate to the social good that was being um, uh, sought to be attain, achieved, uh, how that would um, uh, apply in practice. And um, let me just give one last example, because I'm going to come back to all of these in terms of what the general comment says. And one last example of some of those open questions back a couple of years ago had to do with regard to the relationship of Article 19 with Article 20. Uh, you'll recall Article 20 is the requirement on states to prohibit certain forms of extreme hate speech, around which, by the way, a, 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 a mythological sense appears to have arisen in many contexts that the requirement is to criminally prohibit uh, uh, extreme speech. Uh, there's no reference to criminal uh, prohibition whatsoever in Article 20. It just says prohibit. So prohibition could be through civil means. Uh, uh, but that was already quite clear. I just mentioned it because a, a, a misunderstanding Standing seemed to have emerged and it had taken, it had taken a life of its own. But in any case, the, a more general issue needed to be clarified as to whether um, Article 20, uh, it, just how it related to 19, and whether things could be blocked under 20 in a manner where somehow they would have had to be permitted under 19. Um, so it's with regard to the, it's in the context of a, of a vast global debate. Uh, and a, a very large number of questions, such as those I've just given to you, that the committee decided to go ahead and adopt its new general comment. What is a general comment? It's a curiosity. Uh, you'll find nothing like it in the regional treaties. Um, but in the United Nations context, uh, for reasons partly of a formal legislative mandate, in the treaty I'm talking about, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and also the curious history of the committees having to struggle very hard in their early days in the context of the Cold War to come up with something useful to guide states that didn't constitute an explicit criticism of a given state. Uh, out of this, uh, this, this double base emerged the practice of developing broad jurisprudential reflections uh, on the given provisions of the treaty that didn't speak to a problem or a case or a a particular situation in any country, but rather were, a, 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 as I said, a global jurisprudential reflection that could be applied anywhere. Um, and um, 
from very modest beginnings with timid little documents that didn't say an awful lot about anything to anybody, um, the general comments developed over the life of the committee into pretty strong, detailed legal analysis. Uh, which, um, which can be used as an important reference point for anybody who's seeking to apply these um, treaties, these provisions, at whatever level, be it at the international context, uh, among states, or the various treaty bodies, uh, be it in terms of the uh, making of law uh, at the national level, or be it for the advocacy platform of civil society, or whatever else. Uh, and um, the committee itself, the Human Rights Committee, uh, it, is of the view, and states are increasingly supporting the view, that the general comments have a high legal status uh, as interpretive uh, instruments produced by the most qualified and the most mandated of oversight bodies internationally. Um, in order to preserve that sense of their high interpretive value, uh, the Human Rights Committee uh, pays great attention to seeking not to make new law with a general comment. The committee has no function in making law. Like a court, it's there to interpret and apply the law. Uh, and it, it's assiduous in attempting to respect that principle uh, as it pulls together the threads for these documents. And the key to that is by building them up from its own past practice. Uh, and and only, only where it's unavoidable uh, because of an absence of past practice and where the application of the legal logic of the past practice to a new situation is unavoidably clear, it's only then that it'll go into a territory on which there may not be a lot of, um, of precedence. Um, but it's, um, it's on this basis, in any case, that the, gener that the committee proceeded to work on this general comment uh, and it deals with all the others that it has done in its history. It's done 34 now uh, and we've just embarked on the 35th. How, what was the process for the development of the general comment? Well, the first, the first stage, of course, is to get agreement on a topic which is never straightforward uh, and can involve quite a lot of negotiation over a time within the committee as to what is the article most in need of a fresh look, uh, of fresh attention. But ultimately, in a debate uh, that took place nearly three years ago, it was eventually agreed that freedom of expression was a critically sensitive one in the way I've just described to you. Uh, next stage is to appoint uh, a member of the committee uh, to oversee the drafting process, to prepare the first draft and then manage the negotiation exercise right through to close of play. And uh, I was chosen to do that job. Uh, my first task then, of course, was to do a draft, um, which I did um, a, a, over a course of a summer, uh, attempting as best I might uh, to capture the existing practice of the committee and to keep remembering, and this was something I had to learn in the doing, that I was not writing a super clever article. Um, I, it, this was not the place for me to put in all O'Flaherty's little bright ideas or his amazing insights on this or that. The sort of stuff any academic would, would see as you know, the automatic process when you're writing something for publication, but rather to faithfully reflect the practice and leave gaps where gaps had to be left and only go so far when practice only allowed one to go so far. Sometimes frustrating, but absolutely critical if this thing is to win approval uh, inside the committee in the first instance and outside subsequently. I took that draft to the committee um, where we negotiated it over well over a year, uh, painstakingly, paragraph through paragraph. Uh, we negotiated the document uh, uh, through without any outside involvement. At this point, uh, it's an internal matter for the committee even though it happens in public. So if any of you are researching this, the summary record is available. Um, every last uh, moment of the debate was in a public session uh, in our sessions in New York and in Geneva. Uh, and um, at the end of that first draft then, it was uh, that first reading rather, it was my task to pull together everything that had been negotiated and discussed and agreed uh, and um, sign off on a second draft. And that second draft uh, was then put out for public comment. And I don't know, I don't recall to be honest, and I apologise if it's the case, but I'm not sure if anybody in Cork actually made a submission uh, on the second draft. But we received an extraordinary response. Uh, to put it in context, uh, for previous general comments, if we got maybe 20, 25 submissions uh, in response to our call for uh, uh, views uh, on a draft general comment, we'd consider we were doing extremely well. 
Well, on this comment, we got 350 drafting recommendations. Uh, 80 sources, but a grand total of 300 specific suggestions on how the text might be adjusted, changed, improved, uh, or whatever else it might be. Now, as you can imagine, that presented a negotiation challenge, uh, but uh, before I get to that, let's just say a word, because it is significant as to where the suggestions came from. Um, as you'd imagine, uh, the majority of them came from civil society and from academia, and, and that's not the point I wanted to flag up this morning. More important and significant for the process of, of, of the development of, of, of law and legal understanding in the United Nations was that 20 of those submissions came from states. Uh, and among those states was the United States. Now, why do I make that point? I, I make that point because traditionally, not many states have engaged with the drafting of general comments um, for reasons one can only speculate about, but one suspects that one of those reasons is because they want to maintain a healthy ambiguity as to whether these general comments are, are or are not a good idea at all. In other words, if the, if the general comment is good, we'll applaud it. If it's not, we'll say general comments are not the proper business of these monitoring bodies. They should get back to the day job or the real job. Um, but the fact that 20 states came in rather supportively and gave suggestions was really an important moment in the story of general comments. And then what, what about the United States? And the significance here was that this was the first time ever that the United States had chosen to comment on a general comment uh, during the pathway uh, through its development. Uh, and when one considers the significance of the United States uh, in the United Nations context, in terms of just about every element of its work program, for them to have engaged at that point and to have endorsed the very phenomenon of a general comment uh, constituted a pretty important day in terms of uh, international law. All of that said, second draft, um, put it through the committee, a great desire to get this thing through as quickly as possible. So the second reading was a much swifter one than the first, an attempt as best we might to uh, take on board those 350 suggestions. Um, and we also had to take account of the Arab Spring. Um, the first reading took place in a fairly normal period. The second reading uh, took place last year uh, at the very height of all of the activities in Egypt and elsewhere in North Africa and across uh, the, the, the countries that are generally seen as having participated in the Arab Spring, uh, a season which I'd suggest is well and truly over. Um, but the, um, uh, it, this undoubtedly changed the tone and the tenor of the negotiation. Um, there was a strong new voice for democracy and for liberal understanding of human rights coming out of that part of the world that I'd suggest really did have a role to play in how we move forward. And it meant, and I'll illustrate this uh, when I get to the contents in a few moments, uh, this is illustrated by ways in which the text was dramatically tightened and improved in the second reading in a manner which you could not have predicted uh, based on the original draft and on the way in which uh, things were dealt with in the first, uh, in the first reading. But I'll, I'll, I'll just leave that a bit tantalizing for a minute and give you a few examples uh, in, a, in a couple of moments. Let me now turn to the draft. What did the Human Rights Committee come up with uh, on freedom of expression in General Common 34? How did it answer or succeed in answering the questions I uh, suggested at the outset? Well, in the first place, uh, it, it dealt, of course, with the scope of freedom of expression. You remember the questions there about how wide is expression? And, um, well, it couldn't be wider. It couldn't be wider. Um, uh, the general comment at paragraph 11 said, and it's only a line, uh, this right, freedom of expression, includes the expression and the receipt of communications of every form of idea and opinion capable of transmission to others, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et every form of transmission of idea capable of transmission. Now, this is an important statement. This clears up any number of doubts and uncertainties. It also opens up tantalizing vistas of where future application of freedom of expression might go. For example, uh, does the manner in which you choose to convey your gender identity 
uh, be, uh, uh, regardless of whatever that might be, and regardless of whether that be the one society assumes you should conform to or not. But does the way in which you transmit your gender identity through your clothes, uh, through whatever else uh, uh, about your deportment, is that expression for purposes of Article 19? I'm not going to answer that. I'm just going to leave it with you in, in, in terms of uh, interesting routes we might go down in light of uh, paragraph 11. Um, the sec a second dimension of uh, the scope uh, that I'd mention uh, has to do, of course, with the internet. And uh, the, um, this is dealt with in a very forthright way uh, in the general comment. It's paragraph 15. I'll give you these paragraph references, even though it's very bad. It's very bad speaking style to be throwing that sort of stuff at you, but in case anybody wants to take a note of them. Um, because uh, the... Um, I think ultimately the committee members, and it had little to do with me because I didn't understand some of this stuff, uh, but the committee uh, adopted really strong language, making absolutely clear uh, that freedom of expression, classic freedom of expression, applies to every conceivable information platform, be they those we know of today or those for the future. In other words, information technology is so extraordinary uh, that if we come back here in 10 years' time, there may be forms of information transmission which are, even be, are so, so extraordinary, so remarkable, that they're even beyond our imagination today. And we have to identify that even they will be covered by the protections of freedom of expression. And finally, uh, there's that matter of freedom of information. And here, uh, 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 I think the general comment achieves something pretty remarkable, uh, because it, and I, I'd have to say, somewhat to my surprise, the committee agreed on language around freedom of expression, which is the most elaborated statement that freedom of expression embraces freedom of information uh, that has ever been done in, in international legal practice. You won't find anything like it anywhere else. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights has dealt with quite discrete issues of, of, of access to information. The Inter-American Court ha ha has done it in a, in a somewhat summary fashion, but nowhere will you find as elaborated a reflection uh, as you get now in the general comment. And um, beyond recognising that there is a right of access to, 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 to information, at least information held in the public domain, there is also, and this is one of those things that came in that second reading, which um, I hadn't expected, and I certainly hadn't put in the early draft, which, uh, and I quote from paragraph 19. State parties should make every... Where is it? Oh, I don't quote it. I'll just tell you what it is. Um, a, a, and it's simply the single ball sentence that state parties, the states, have a duty to proactively put into the public domain uh, information that they would consider to be of public interest. That proactive dimension uh, was not in the earlier drafts, I hadn't anticipated it, uh, uh, and it's a reflection of that vim uh, in the drafting uh, in the second reading. So that's the scope of freedom of expression. But nobody is challenging the proposition that for all the scope of expression, uh, it is subject to limitations. Um, to say something can be recognised as expression is not to say it must be allowed. Um, to, to stand up here and rant anti-Semitic hatred is expression. But that's not by any means the same as the, um, the, the, the presumption that it may be permitted. Uh, and so much then of the general comment that follows on mapping the scope has to do with mapping the permissible space for limitation by the state. And that's actually by far the longest part of the entire document. And again, I'll just pick up a few headline issues from that that I hope will be of some interest. Uh, firstly, there's the issue of legality. Uh, the extent to which, uh, if a state purports to limit expression, it must do so in law, uh, what, what does that legal dimension require? The, um, there are many elements here. Um, one is that law, for purposes of the legal reference, may not include traditional, customary, or religious law, maybe not so relevant for us here, but certainly relevant where uh, uh, customary or religious law holds sway uh, in a state, and there are many such states in the world, and, uh, uh, and now it's clear that uh, a limitation on expression, let's say uh, with regard to blasphemy, that's uh, rooted in a traditional or religious precept that has the force of law in the state, will not meet the legality test for Article 19. 
Um, secondly, a law which allows an unfettered discretion on any actor, any administrative actor, uh, is also incompatible with the principle of legality. So if we go back to our superintendent, and I, I don't actually know what the provision is in the Republic of Ireland, so I'm not making a comment about the law here when I say this, but if the superintendent was given under statute some unfettered discretion uh, to uh, demand email information, let's say, uh, then um, that would be incompatible with the, the provision. Um, the second element of the, uh, the, the, the space in which states can restrict that uh, might be of interest to you has to do with the purposes for which the state chooses to restrict the expression. Um, the, the Covenant, Article 19, says a state can only purport to limit freedom of expression for a limited number of designated purposes, national security, uh, public order, um, protection of morals. Uh, and they're, they're, they're rather wide categories, uh, and they do need to be, uh, to be tightened up a little bit. And uh, you, the, an interesting question that one might ask is to what extent the committee succeeded in tightening up those categories in the general comment. Well, in the first place, it didn't do as good a job as many would like, and I'll come back to that in, in, a, in a little while. Uh, but in the context of just one of those purposes, it did something really quite remarkable, because it, it, took, on, it, it took on the challenge of, of, of clarifying what morals are. Because as you can imagine, restricting, if, for a government to restri restrict human rights on the basis of morals uh, uh, leaves open all sorts of possibilities of abuse. Um, in, in a context of our highly complex societies and, and, and contested notions of what is morality, what is a moral norm, uh, what is a moral norm that somehow uh, um, uh, 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 trumps another one uh, and could be enforced by the state. It's, it's, it's an area wide open to abuse uh, and the committee chose to engage on that. And it made clear, and again, if you want the paragraph, it's paragraph 32, uh, it made clear in the general comment that the invocation of morality to limit expression, and I suggest to limit other human rights as well, because I think we can transpose the findings here uh, across the treaty. Um, a state must not only show that the moral precept it's relying on is common to the society, is present in more than one community in the society, but also that that moral precept must be compatible with the standards of universality and non-discrimination. Now, I, I find that remarkable. Um, to invoke a moral norm to limit rights, the, the, the morality must be compatible with the universality of human rights. Uh, and again, I, 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 I won't get into trouble by suggesting examples, uh, but if you just think about that, uh, I think that does really limit the space within which a state can rely on morality in order to limit rights. Um, a third category of, um, of, 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 of limitation or reflection on the limitation that the general comment takes on board in a way that I think is very useful is it spells out what the, 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 what, what, what the contents are of the requirement on the state in limiting rights that the limitation be necessary on the one hand and that it be proportionate on the other. I mentioned proportionality earlier. I won't say much more about it now because uh, we don't have the time. Uh, I can come back to it in the question and answer if you like. But for those of you who are interested in these topics, um, the, 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 the language around the content of the tests of necessity and proportionality, and just as importantly, their relationship to each other, uh, is spelled out in, in more detail than had ever been attempted before. And then finally, in terms of uh, these limitations, uh, it's at paragraph 35, and here again is one, an example of something that came in late in the day, uh, unexpectedly, uh, uh, and with, I think, pretty profound implications for the protection of human rights globally, and that was that um, language on a nexus test was put into the general comment. Language on the necessary relationship between the limitation the state is trying to impose uh, and the um, actions um, and, the, and, the, uh, and the harm that could be done by the expression that's at issue. Um, so in other words, a vague generalized sense that that bunch are dangerous and therefore their speech must be limited uh, can, it would no longer be acceptable. You would need to identify for each and every one of that bunch why 
each and every one of them explicitly uh, is saying or is about to say something uh, that, that, that will do the great harm to society. Uh, and again, this, this nexus test tightens things up, I think, considerably uh, and has pretty, pretty wide implications in terms of, for example, censorship and uh, blocking of websites uh, and, and things of that nature. So that's, um, that's as much as I wanted to say about the um, scope in the first place and the restrictive space for freedom of expression on the other. Let me wrap up my um, comments on the contents of the general comment by moving on to the final section of the document and picking up on a few of the, um, the examples that the committee gives in applying its theory, its doctrine laid out in the earlier part of the document to the types of situation with which the Human Rights Committee has to tackle on a continuous basis across the world as it reviews the human rights situation in those 167 states parties. Um, we did that for two reasons. One was to give guidance because um, people using these documents are not just uh, jurists um, who, who can read the theory and apply it at ease without the aid of an example, but also activists and others promoting human rights around the world. And, 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 and it's necessary to give that added dimension of explication uh, of, 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 of what had gone before. But secondly, it was also necessary because states, very unhelpfully, will never tell you exactly which ground they're, they're, they're basing their restriction on. So if a state restricts freedom of expression uh, in, 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 let's say, in the context of uh, journalism, they block a, a newspaper article um, because it's going to do grave harm to the society, uh, and then they, they, they're challenged as to on what basis they've done it. They tend never to, they never go for the national security uh, argument or the protection of morals argument or the protection of public order argument. They just lump them all together and they refer to the entire cluster in the treaty, which is, happens to be in paragraph 3 of Article 19, and they say, we, we limited that speech uh, because it, it was legitimate and justified under 19.3. And so um, uh, this, this meant that uh, there's a tremendous amount of state practice out there uh, that we, we had to capture and include in this general comment, even though it wasn't possible to locate it neatly under the different components uh, that had been laid out in the theoretical section. So just to give you a few examples of, 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 of positions taken by the committee, uh, hopefully completely compatible with the doctrine. Well, the first was, and, and there, there's no particular logical order to these, I just picked a few that you might find interesting. Uh, the first of those has to do with um, monopolistic control of private media, uh, where the committee has made clear that it's part of the state's duty under Article 19 uh, to take all appropriate action uh, to prevent uh, private media developing monopolistic frameworks um, uh, in whatever state it might be. Now, we will all, we'll all differ on what's appropriate for the government to do in the context of the private sector. Uh, North American approaches will be rather different to European approaches, for example, but nevertheless the state duty is clear. Um, another example, uh, a very interesting one, uh, of the application of the general comment has to do with the new media. Every time you tweet you're a journalist. Every time you blog, you're a journalist. We're all journalists, in a sense, with a small j. Journalists with a big j don't like that at all. Um, uh, quite understandably, uh, there are fears that the very important, that socially vital profession of journalism is under threat and risk and needs to be protected. While, on the other hand, all the rest of us, including, by the way, human rights defenders, many of whom put their lives at risk to carry out this work, they also say, we also need some of the protections uh, and the frameworks of the journalistic space in order to do what we're doing. Uh, and the general comment had to somehow balance these two legitimate and correct demands and come up with some sort of guidance. And it sought to do that uh, in uh, paragraph 44. Uh, the general comment moved on and looked at uh, all manner of issues of defamation. Very difficult task because uh, the manifestation of defamation laws across the world is a many-headed thing. Uh, and you know, defamation in some legal systems is managed, dealt with, uh, uh, um, ex uh, uh, spelled out in a fashion that's 
entirely incomprehensible to somebody from another part of the world. And we needed, as a global body, to somehow come up with generally useful guidance on defamation that could speak to the variety of the systems. And uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, that led to our developing what is, without a doubt, the densest paragraph of the general comment, paragraph 47. Uh, full of elements, I don't have time to go through them all, but just one of which is a view that states should con consider the decriminalization of defamation. Um, weak language. Most other places the committee says the states shall do X, Y or Z because that's clearly uh, deriving from the legal standards. But on the matter of criminal defamation, we're not there yet. Uh, the most the committee could agree was that this is a, 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 the appropriate route to go, uh, but the level of practice and jurisprudence wasn't yet there to say definitively that criminal defamation will always be incompatible with freedom of expression. But uh, imprisonment for defamation will always be incompatible with the covenant. Uh, the committee members were willing to go that far. Um, two more little examples, or two more examples briefly. Uh, the penultimate one has to do with laws which I don't think we have here in Ireland, and, we, and certainly they don't have in the United Kingdom. Uh, they are what we call uh, colloquially memory laws, uh, telling us what we may or may not believe about the past. Uh, but uh, Holocaust denial laws would be for an example of this, this type of legislation. And, um, Interestingly, instead of saying, as the first draft said, that memory laws raise very serious issues under the Covenant and should be very carefully considered, and in fact the committee had tolerated a memory law in an early case called Forisson in France, um, interestingly, uh, in that second reading that I described to you earlier, the committee was willing to say that memory laws are never compatible with the Covenant. Uh, and then finally, on the issue of blasphemy, uh, uh, we found ourselves almost in that same position uh, as with regard to memory laws. Um, there has been too much practice which acknowledged the role of blasphemy within the state, and, but the committee was willing to adopt language at the very end of the negotiation process to the effect, and you'll find this in paragraph 48, that blasphemy laws are only ever compatible with freedom of expression, with Article 19 of the Covenant, to the extent that they are necessary to honour the duty on states to prohibit extreme hate speech. And that is, I think, I'd suggest to you, quite a remarkable limiting of the space for blasphemy, which would suggest, for example, uh, that, the, um, that the recent criminalisation of uh, certain forms of blasphemy in this jurisdiction would not pass the test of Article 19. So, that's the general comment in headlines, um, though you, you got the short version there. Um, could one critically assess it? Are there any thoughts at the end of the whole exercise uh, uh, giving a sense of whether we pulled it off or not? Um, well, of course, the first thing that needs to be admitted and acknowledged is that I'm a hopeless judge. I'm far too close to the exercise. I'm far too partisan. I'm far too protective. Um, uh, and so therefore anything I say is going to be deeply suspect uh, from the outset. But um, I, th I can be a little bit critical. Um, I could suggest, for example, that we may have missed a few opportunities in the document. We, we grabbed many, many opportunities, but perhaps we missed a couple at the same time. Um, I spoke to you earlier about the grounds on which a state limits expression. I, I, I mentioned how we dug into the notion of morality and came up with something pretty significant. Uh, but we didn't do anything similar with regard to national security, public order, and the other categories of that type. Um, the rights and reputations of others, a very important one, another basis on which the state can limit a freedom of expression. And you'll find very little guidance in here as to what that means. And critics have said that. They've said that's a weakness of the general common. They've said you know, given that one of the great battlegrounds of freedom of expression is the balance of expression against, let's say, privacy, uh, that uh, we could have done with a bit more guidance uh, from you uh, on this. Uh, and the, the, the response that many committee members would give, and I have some sympathy for it, was that actually sometimes over-defining concepts is not helpful at all, uh, uh, and that it, it's best to leave them to be, uh, to be clarified in the application, in the jurisprudence over time, in order among other things, not to find ourselves boxed in in some unknown future because we adopted language that was too constrictive uh, 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 at this moment in history. Um, 
Another concern that's been expressed, which I don't agree with, is that the general comment is, 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 is all about the scope of freedom of expression and the limits on the state's power to restrict it, and that we should have said more about when a state should restrict expression. Um, I, I, that doesn't appeal to me as an argument. Um, it's perfectly clear under, the, under Article 19 of the Covenant that states may restrict expression. Um, what we needed to do was clarify the rule book around that exercise of legitimate state um, uh, action. Uh, it was not for us to provide a permissive um, uh, uh, encouragement to states uh, to do what they're well able to do themselves without our help. Uh, and finally, in terms of critique of the general comment, uh, it's been suggested that the committee went too far uh, with regard to blasphemy laws and memory laws. It, it was overly restrictive, entirely prohibitive with memory laws, overly restrictive on blasphemy, and we'll just have to see. We'll have to see in terms of how the general comment is received, whether that is indeed the case. And then, almost wrapping up, uh, how has the general comment being received. Um, in fact, what does it mean to say that it's being received? Well, in the first place, it means is the Human Rights Committee using it? Uh, and yes, of course it is. Uh, you'll find now that in just about every freedom of expression context that's come before the Human Rights Committee in the last uh, six, seven months, uh, freedom of expression issues have always been framed in terms of the uh, general comment. And when Ireland next comes to the Human Rights Committee, you can be confident that the, um, and I, I won't be part of that process, but you can be confident that uh, the Freedom of Expression General Comment will frame the discussion with the Irish government around that issue. Um, a second dimension of acceptance uh, of the General Comment uh, has to do with the engagement of states. Uh, I mentioned to you earlier the unusually vigorous engagement of states during the negotiation process. Uh, there has been a, a, very good, um, a very good participation of states also in debate around the general common since it was adopted. And I'd have to say, somewhat to my surprise, it's been a positive reaction from states. Uh, we've had a couple of events. We had one where I think every state party to the treaty turned up for a, an event in New York last March where there was no stern, strong criticism, uh, but more a welcome uh, and you know, various views around uh, narrow elements of language, but uh, as of yet at least, no repudiation of the document, and that's very important in terms of how international law gets, gets accepted. Um, civil society, uh, there it's really very exciting. NGOs are working with this general comment to very powerful effect around the world. Uh, it's been cited, for example, repeatedly recently in uh, the uh, African court uh, uh, on the basis of pleadings that were supported by, by, by prominent uh, freedom of expression organizations. Uh, it's being referred to in the UN Human Rights Council, the United Nations General Assembly, uh, and any other manner of forum, including, interestingly, and again, People following these issues will be aware of this. Uh, there is a um, current debate in the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, uh, around the need or otherwise there's a debate as to whether states need to regulate the internet through a government-controlled, state-controlled framework of a new treaty. And I've no idea where that debate will go, but I do know that the general comment has been fed into the discussions and is being taken account of. And one final area. Uh, wh interestingly, where it's being acknowledged is in the work of the private sector. Uh, already, it has framed a lot of the analysis of what uh, uh, individual private companies must do to promote freedom of expression uh, in the form of various uh, sets of um, guidance and principles that their own organizations and institutions have been developing. One was published with regard to internet governance just um, a, a few days ago uh, by a consortium based out of Washington. And so on it goes. Uh, but ultimately, we'll only know if this general comment will have served its purpose uh, if, over time, and looking back on this period, we'll be able to conclude across all the classic forms of expression and the new ones of the internet and whatever else may, we may confront in the future, we may find that freedom of, accession, of expression continues to be perceived as of primordial significance, uh, to be defended uh, to the utmost um, uh, at every level of society and across the world, 
uh, and in the international bodies, and that Article 19 frames that work and the general comment provides the meaning and the content so that that framing can be carried out effectively uh, 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 to the good of us all. So I leave it there and um, I'd be very happy to take any questions or issues you might have in the form of uh, Q&A. Thank you.